Hey, thank you for coming. Today I'm going to introduce a topic that will be developed further next week. The connections and the contrast between Wikipedia and the creation that is at the roots of the changes that led to the creation of Wikipedia, which is the French Encyclopédie of the 18th century. I will not be talking about the final exam today because I should have thought about this, but clearly Friday before Easter, a lot of people are not here, so I'll talk about that on Monday. After the introduction, which will be continued in a historical and cultural way next week, I want to show you a video where one of the founders, the co-founder of Wikipedia, Larry Sanger, is being interviewed in this video by, by a YouTuber. Uh, and uh, this video is just about a month old, so it's very current and focuses a lot on a key issue that we've discussed also, talking about Wikipedia's structure and mission, the issue of neutrality. Those two things are connected because the issue of neutrality, knowledge, expertise, all these issues were being faced by the creator of the French Encyclopédie, Encyclopédia, Encyclopédie um, as they are today. Of course, the solutions differed a lot, right? Because especially in terms of the production times in an, in an encyclopedia from the 18th century is very different from a digital product which can be modified and the changes be published in real time, right? Or right after they have been approved if you're not uh, a uh, constant user, if you don't have a record of having made 500 changes during the last 30 days and therefore whatever changes you make may be subject to the approval of a seasoned editor, of a moderator, etc. So the issue is neutrality. Neutrality is supposed to be uh, one of the key principles on which Wikipedia contents are based, together with sourcing, verifiability, the content has to be neutral. However, how do you execute, how do you implement this philosophy, this principle, which, of course, we can all agree with? I suggest, in order to better frame what we will hear from Larry Sanger, and his position is just one of the possible positions on this, and clearly his position is the position of someone who's very much outside Wikipedia. He co-founded Wikipedia, but Wikipedia remained in the hands of Jimmy Wales, the other founder, and his position is not the position that is being agreed on, followed by Wikipedia and the Wikipedia community these days. But in order to better understand the debate, I suggest that we can look at neutrality across time. This would be the horizontal <laughs> line. Or in any moment in time, within a specific moment in time. And this would be the vertical axis, right? If you look at the horizontal development the development of Wikipedia content through time, how pages are created, revised, checked, reviewed, corrected, then expanded, reviewed again, and revised, then you can hope, based on the traditional understanding of the processing of any kind of cultural content, that in time you start with some facts and any point in time you only have a certain amount of facts, factual information available, and 
usually through time you get more facts, more information on any uh, kind of content, on any kind of entry within Wikipedia. So the horizontal timeline allows for a sudden increase in neutrality, in objectivity, in factual accuracy. Within any given point in time, how is neutrality achieved? And at the bottom, you have the official position of Wikipedia and Jimmy Wales' position, one of the founders, which is only referred to in this interview. At the top, you have the co-founders, Larry Sanger's view, which is different, and of course, he's questioning the validity of the alternative. Of course, I'm showing you the video because it's relevant, because it's part of the debate on this. It, it's not an endorsement, uh, personal, or an endorsement of this class of any view on this complex issue. So, the official approach to the achievement of neutrality by Wikipedia is basically through consensus, through agreement by Wikipedia editors, the Wikipedians, the Wikipedia community. However, how is this agreement reached? Is it reached through the enrichment, the expansion of expertise? That is to say, is the agreement the result of expertise being brought forth to bear on the disagreements, on the controversies, on any page of Wikipedia? Clearly not. First of all, the Wikipedians, those about 130,000 people who, within any space of 30 days, uh, contribute actively to the discussions and to the revisions are not necessarily experts. And in fact, we know that 130,000 is not always the same 130,000 people. However, those who, from not within 30 days, but from the beginning of a year to the end of a year, from one year to the next, contribute regularly, are even fewer than 130,000. And there are some famous examples of people who have contributed thousands of pages, who have contributed hundreds of thousands of changes. Okay? They are not necessarily the experts. Right? And there is a reason for that. Because this is a digital platform. And the time cycle of a digital platform is very quick. Whereas what we consider closer to any kind of objectivity and neutrality, the academic community, the community of intellectuals that we found within the context of general culture, the various groups of experts on any niche topic, they go by a very different kind of time cycle, right? The times, the timeline, of production of research and consensus on research within those communities, the scholars of academia, the researchers of the academic labs, the intellectuals, the experts both in the private sector, in the public sector, in the academic sectors, follow very different timelines. Their production requires a longer time. Right? I, I had a colleague when I came to Stony Brook who was also a mentor to me, Frederick Brown. He was an eminent French scholar, author of biographies. So he would spend a minimum of 10 years to produce a biography. He produced the biography of Zola, one of Flaubert, uh, a, a minor biography of Gide, but he would take 10 years for a single volume, for a single biography. Right. That is clearly not the timeline of a digital platform, right? It's similar to the time cycle of news, meaning everything happens within a few hours, within a few days, 
right? Right or wrong, neutral or not, or biased, accurate or only partially accurate. So, if expertise is not brought to bear on the reaching of a consensus or an agreement, what is? It's essentially arguments, right? Argumentations. It's a discussion where some factual information, some expertise is at play, clearly, right? It's not completely absent, but there is a deep, radical difference between expertise and arguments. An argument is developed logically, and the logical construction of an argument can be applied to anything, both to accurate and inaccurate content or information. That is to say, you can build a solid argument based on the instruments and the strategies of rhetoric to demonstrate something that is, in fact, not true or incorrect, right? And logic and science were coupled and combined into the 16th century, right? Up until the 16th century. And even if you take famous founders, modern fathers of science, Galileo Galilei, for example, you find Galileo, especially in his university courses, using logic a lot to establish scientific truths. For example, uh, about the planets, about the satellites, about what one can observe about the spots you can, you can see with the telescope on the planets or on the sun. He uses Aristotelian logic, right, to establish those. But right after the end of the 17th century, from the 18th century on, science and logical argumentation take two different routes. And with reason, because the, let's examine the alternative view that is being proposed by Larry Sanger. Larry Sanger says there is agreement that leads to publication or revision of content on Wikipedia. It doesn't guarantee neutrality. True. The alternative he is embracing and endorsing is the inclusion of opposing views within the articles of Wikipedia, which in principle, sounds fine. However, the problem goes back to the contrast between expertise and arguments. Look at a classical example in the debate about the need to include opposing views within education. During the 1990s, you have the emerging of a debate in the school system in the US as well as in the universities. And the debate is about the teaching of Darwin's evolution, which I put there shortened as DE, Darwin's evolution, whereby there are uh, not only members of the community, parents involved with uh, uh, the, the school curriculum, but also members of academia who say you cannot no matter where the con what the context is, high school class or a university class, you cannot just be teaching Darwin's evolution for which we know there are flaws or gaps without also giving room, giving space to the opposite view, which is ID intelligent design. Meaning a well-argumenting, a well-argumented uh, case for the existence of God. Basically, the idea that the universe, everything in nature, was created by God, and if we look at the evidence, we find clues supporting this idea that God created nature, and therefore both of these positions, opposite views, should be included in the curriculum. And what is the problem? And this, of course, uh, didn't really happen, right? Yeah, th there were a few exceptions, some schools that did this, some very few universities who did this, but basically it went nowhere. Because what is the issue? The issue is that 
Darwin's evolution, which is not uh, entirely clear or not a comprehensive explanation of natural phenomena, the same way that Einstein's relativity is not a comprehensive explanation of uh, physics. And today there are theories that have expanded Einstein, Einstein's relativity. Darwin's evolution is based on scientific expertise, right? Not a complete set of theories, theories that need revision, but scientific foundation is found at the basis of those theories. The other, intelligent design, is based on a logical argumentation. It's culture versus science, okay? So, representing opposing views is not exactly a way to reach neutrality because you are playing apples versus oranges. And this kind of reasoning which si sounds philosophically correct is, is in itself somewhat flawed, intrinsically subject to strong limitations. Now, in terms of the horizontal development, this idea that time will bring an increase in knowledge, an increase in factual or accurate information, is nothing new. And that is the reason why, when we look at the past, we find this kind of issue faced also by the intellectuals who produced the French Encyclopedia of the uh, 18th century in France, which was the model for future encyclopedias, and basically it is also the model in terms of the mission, the manifesto of Wikipedia. The idea was expressed in classical antiquity and through the Renaissance with the Latin saying, veritas filia temporis, truth is the daughter of time. Meaning, time will tell, right? Which is the common English phrase. Now, when this is being repeated during the Middle Ages and even the Renaissance, when you see it in frescoes, uh, there are frescoes where you find this label, right? Where you find a scroll with this written on it. You have to understand that it seems like a philosophical approach, and it isn't. Because ultimately, in a religious society, such as that of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance as well, because secularization is a process that starts uh, at the end of the 15th century and it takes uh, another 100 or 150 years to take place. Don't forget, we mentioned Galileo Galilei. He was uh, sent to house arrest by the church, right, for... Uh, his ideas of science and how science should lead to a different understanding of the Bible. Galilei would say, I, uh, I read the Bible not to understand how the heavens work, but how heaven works. Meaning how uh, to go to heaven if you're religious, not how the planets work and how they move around, which is not with the sun at the cent with the earth at the center of the solar system, but rather with the sun. God is, in the traditional religious belief, God is the owner of time. Time be belongs to God because God created the universe. Time is an intrinsic quality of the universe. Therefore, God owns time, and God, of course, uh, also has access to eternity. Right? And, and time is a creation, is part of the creation. So, with time, we'll have an increase of truth. This is secularized as a concept by the producers of the French Encyclopedia, which, as we will see next week in their manifesto, will say this is a multi generational platform, their printed encyclopedia. It's not a one off thing. It will be continued, it will be revised, it will be expanded. New generations will work on it. 
we'll keep what is still valid, we'll add what time has brought on to, to add in, term, uh, in terms of uh, more or better truth, but it is something to be transmitted to the next generation. It's an open-ended project. And that's the idea that you find both in Wikipedia as well as the French Encyclopédie. In terms of timeline, I put there Encyclopédia because the French Encyclopédia, the traditional Encyclopédia, do rely on academia, on intellectuals, on experts in various niche areas to produce the knowledge and to guarantee the neutrality of their content. But clearly, every encyclopedia from the past works on much longer times, right? The French encyclopedia took more than 20 years to be published, to publish all the volumes. And, and that is not unusual well into the Britannica Encyclopedia Britannica of the 20th century in terms of cycle. It's a multi-year cycle, whereas if you take Wikipedia, every moment in time is important, even though the real cycle of the average kind of content on Wikipedia, meaning not a page on a celebrity scandal, not a page on a politician uh, involved in a presidential campaign during the last months of those campaigns, but otherwise the average cycle for a page in Wikipedia takes place over not even days, but weeks or months, sometimes years as well, okay? So where does it come, this idea of an increase of knowledge with time? It starts with Christianity, right? Because in classical cultures, such as the culture of the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans, there are multiple models, but the prevailing model of time is cyclical, a cyclical model, meaning that in Greek philosophy and Greek culture, everything comes back. Everything goes back to its beginning. Everything is ultimately repeating. There is no telos. The telos applied to, as a base word to this word, teleology, the conception of what is the final destination of the journey of a community, what is the end goal, what is the destination, applied to a nation, it becomes the mission of a nation in 18th century, 19th century culture. The idea that there is an end goal, that there must be some kind of destination to the human experience, is first clearly introduced by the Christians. Because there, you don't have a cyclical model of time. You have time as an arrow. Because time has a starting point, the creation. Time has a destination or an end point, the end of times. Apocalypse, the uh, final judgment, which is also the day when everything will be revealed, right? When all the good people, living and dead, will be saved, uh, will be introduced to eternal salvation, and all the bad people, alive or dead, will be condemned to hell forever. However, this idea of the development of everything in the human experience, including knowledge, including truth, in a linear way, is not exactly what we now think as progress. Because what you hear now say by average individuals, how can this happen in 2022, right? How could the subway in New York not be safe in 2022? Or how could students not have an education, a proper education from schools in 2022? This kind of reasoning, which has become embedded in the culture of many Western societies is not a reflection of this Christian model. It is instead the model of the intellectuals of the Enlightenment, the same that produced the Encyclopedia. Because in the Christian model, yes, there is a starting point, creation, there is an end point, final judgment, the end of times, when the 
human experience is closed, concluded, and everyone is brought, whether they're dead or alive, everyone is taken either to hell or to paradise. This experience is not linear in terms of progress, meaning there isn't an increase necessarily of everything positive, including truth, throughout time. What is being combined with the linearity of this evolution, so humans are journeying towards the end of time, which according to the scripture was supposed to be soon, right? And therefore, uh, at the beginning of the proper Middle Ages, around the year 1000, you have people believing that exactly in the year 1000, the earth will, will end, that there will be the uh, end of times, right? They, le they really believe that would happen because they interpreted the scripture to hint that it was only a matter of a limited amount of time before the human experience would be over, would be closed by God. Combined with this view, there is the idea that the human experience, life, is just a series of tests and tribulations. And based on the way you are tested, meaning tempted, or the tribulation you suffer and how you react to that, sooner or later you go through a cycle of fall, right? You will sin, you will fall from grace, you will fall from a proper relationship with God, and redemption, right? Eventually you will find your way up. But this is the idea of the human experience, not constant progress, not constant improvement generation after generation. No, because generation after generation in this Christian model, human nature is still flawed. And therefore, my son will not be better because he belongs to the next generation. He's still human. He will have tests, temptations tribulation, suffering that will fall him to fall from grace in different ways, but the cycle is still the same, right? Because the uh, quality, the main quality of human nature is to be imperfect, okay? I feel like I'm doing a, an Easter sermon, okay? <laughs> now, you, you have this idea, and yes, some of the truth will be revealed in time. But again, it's not a necessary increase in the amount of truth because when you say, when you subscribe to the idea up until the Renaissance and through the Middle Ages that truth is the daughter of time, you also understand that God owns the truth, so it's God who's revealing the truth to us. Right? Which means, again, that the next generation is not necessarily savvier or better than the current generation. There isn't this idea of constant progress in terms of positive change, right? Which leads to that kind of trivial reasoning that I mentioned. How can it be that in 2022 and then add any kind of problem that we still have? We still have a war between Russia and Ukraine, right? There shouldn't be. These things belong to the past. Uh, we're evolved. We are better educated, we have better knowledge, so these things should not happen. This idea of progress as constant positive change. Now, the Enlightenment, and I'll talk about the social and cultural changes next week that led to the French Enlightenment or the Enlightenment in other European countries, the Enlightenment instead still subscribes to a linear model, right? Which starts with the creation of the universe which you can interpret later on in a scientific way, clearly not the act of an eternal being. But there is progress based on the assumption that the more time goes by, the more knowledge we introduce into the system. However, and this goes back to the idea of the conversion of knowledge. Knowledge from being something abstract to knowledge being part of the knowledge industry, of the knowledge economy. However, this knowledge is not a neutral element in the context of social changes. This knowledge, or part of it, will be in time, generation after generation, applied. Applied to society, and of course, applied to the economy, and therefore 
efficiency becomes a driving force, right? Today's worker needs to be more efficient, and certainly industrial worker need to put in more intensive labor, more prolonged efforts than agricultural workers from the Middle Ages, right? The modern industrial worker is like a machine. You have to be productive. You have to be 100% productive, 100% efficient, and that will be the bane of your existence after you find a job. Wait and see the fun that it is to be working in a modern organization, right? So if progress is based on knowledge, and knowledge is sooner or later applied to produce improvements, efficiency and other kinds of improvement, there you have as a result the concept of progress, right? How can we have all those problems I mentioned before? Crimes in the subway, or war in Ukraine, or uh, lack of proper skills uh, in students who have completed their studies. If we have this knowledge, if we have more knowledge than we had 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, and better applications of knowledge, and we should be more efficient. And there you have the belief that, yes, we can be neutral, we can try and achieve neutrality, but eventually in the long run, even if we're not neutral now, based on this mechanism of agreement, we will be neutral eventually. We will be factual, we will be accurate eventually. Okay? This is the somewhat complicated introduction to the video, and now we watch the video together, almost all of it, about 20 minutes. And, of course, I will ask you for comments or questions on Monday. And this is the co-founder, just a moment for the projector to warm up. This is Larry Sanger, the co-founder of Wikipedia, talking about neutrality and other issues. Very stereotypical Wikipedian, right? A lot of Wikipedians look like that, I guarantee you. Uh, white males uh, with, with that kind of nerdy look and that kind of brainy disposition. Uh, this, of course, as I said, uh, is not itself a neutral presentation of the issue. And we're not trying to say this is how we should think of Wikipedia. But I, I think it's very timely, uh, as I said, this is, oh no, actually, I was wrong. It's not from a month ago. It's from July 14th, 2021, but it's still recent enough.